HHS. <laughs> With several colleagues, we are recording the meeting. And so if uh, anybody does not want to be on a recording, uh, feel free to exit now. So I'm going to start sharing screen and uh, I'm going to be sharing the speakers placed here with uh, several of my colleagues today. Um, so, and uh, yeah, folks can just go ahead and just keep letting folks in. So um, we have uh, several colleagues, you know, Dr. Sears, Dr. Belial, uh, we've got Kristen McCauley from Maine DHHS and Tanya Philbrick, sorry, Tanya, put your title there. Um, with the uh, main CDC and the immunization program. Um, we, uh, this time slot is the one that we've used for our clinician info sessions for several months now, uh, but we've expanded it uh, this week to one hour sessions. And we are, we do have one hour CME credit for folks who are interested in that. Um, I saw Dr. D'Augustine, thanks for the prompt on that. So we did extend that to one hour credit for both MDs and then with the Osteopathic Association, uh, the approval is pending, but I am told by Amanda Richards that is highly likely. So um, if you are looking for a CME credit, either from the AMA or AOA, usual, uh, if you can email your name and let us know whether you're looking for um, MD or DO credit. Uh, specifically, and then just the usual um, email with cme.thhs at main.gov. Uh, that would be very helpful, and we'll be working through both of the associations um, on that. Um, I mentioned we're hosting a one hour, we have no um, uh, relationships to disclose, one hour session today for those who can stay on uh, because we wanted to really take a, a little bit different. Typically, these info sessions have been very focused on clinical issues related to COVID vaccines. And uh, today it's related, but it's uh, we're trying to focus a little bit more broadly on the notion of vaccinating in physician or clinician practices. Um, we recognize uh, things are changing. Uh, we wanna share some data with you about local needs and talk a bit more than we normally do about some of the nuts and bolts of practice-based vaccination um, and uh, hear from any of you about who might be doing it about best practices uh, and then uh, have time for Q&A. Uh, we may not go the full hour, but wanted to make that available to you. Also just say up front, we are doing uh, the similar session as we usually do on Fridays at noontime, but that will also be a one hour session. And then, <clears throat> so this Friday, which is the 28th, and then the following Thursday, the Maine Primary Care Association and I should mention the associations have been very helpful in trying to help us with this and promote uh, getting the word out. So MMA, MOA, Maine Primary Care Association and the Maine Hospital Association. Uh, but next Thursday, June 3rd, we're gonna be hosting a similar session at four o'clock. That is normally the um, office hours for the Primary Care Association, uh, but anybody can join that. So just to start out briefly on um, how we're doing, I think as a state, hopefully you've all heard, we continue to do um, very well over 1.3 million, close to 1.4 million uh, vaccines um, administered. Uh, and we're now uh, getting close to 60% of uh, first dose for the full population and uh, just over 57% for the final, uh, final dose, uh, whether that's one J&J &J or the series of Moderna and Pfizer. Um, in the state rankings, Maine continues to do extremely well. Uh, but as we know, uh, it's likely going to be a lot easier, as I've been saying for a while, to get the first 50% than the second, whether it's 20 or 30%, obviously will never be to 100%. Um, we um, have, uh, I think, been doing a nice job, the staff at DHHS, in tracking various aspects of vaccine on the vaccine dashboard you can see here. And not surprisingly, some of the highest rates have been in the older population, as you are all probably quite familiar. We just um, uh, were able to open up Pfizer vaccine to uh, the 12 to 17 year old. And I think there's been some great movement there. You can see uh, some significant numbers uh, in the early days of vaccinating uh, those groups. And we still have a ways to go. Um, Kristen is going to jump into more um, uh, finer parsing of some of the local data, but you can see on the uh, dashboard, we also have considerable variations by county on the right-hand side there, the darker colors are the higher percent vaccinated per 100,000 residents. And not unlike the rest of the country, we're seeing uh, lower rates of vaccine acceptance uh, or um, actually having got the vaccine. We know there's different, different uh, approaches that people have. It's not necessarily you know, what we might call classic uh, vaccine hesitancy, but just a, a wait and see, or we're not quite there yet. Uh, we're seeing more of that in the rural or rim counties. 
um, we've also talked a little bit on some of the previous um, calls, but uh, to really emphasize the point, we, we, we know it's time and, and I know this has met with some frustration, you know, where we couldn't necessarily um, uh, distribute vaccine to physician or clinician practices in the early days uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, really trying to get the vaccine out quickly, a lot of the storage and handling requirements, um, and trying to drive people to the large volume sites. But we know and have known that physicians and other clinicians are often cited as the most trusted source uh, for healthcare information and specifically for vaccination information as well. Uh, and uh, we think it's really time to uh, put a bigger push on trying to get COVID vaccines into uh, physician and clinician practices because we think they really offers a key strategy for reaching that movable middle. The people who are saying, well, I'm just not quite there yet. I, I might do it if it's easy for me or I'm, I wanna wait and see. So um, thinking that as we now sort of move past the phase of the large scale vaccine sites, you've seen several of them are wrapping up operations at this point as demand goes down, we need to really change the strategy and think how we bring vaccine to the people, how we bring it out into communities and particularly in rural communities. We know that physician or clinician practices can offer uh, a really important access point uh, to continue offering vaccine to people. Um, I mentioned on the vaccine dashboard, we have the county data. There's also uh, this shot of the zip code data, and I'm using that primarily as an intro again to show that there are significant variations and to tee up uh, Kristen McCauley from Maine DHHS, who's gonna uh, bring us into a, a deeper dive into some of that data and really make the case for why we need to offer um, a vaccine in more sites, particularly in our rural communities where we see the gaps. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing, Kristen, so you can start sharing. And you're still mute. There you go. Good morning. Can you see my screen? All good. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. All right. So as Lisa um, kind of teed me up, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the data that we're seeing um, for vaccination rate, both by county as well as zip code. Um, Lisa did a great job in kind of showing you some of the screenshots where some of this information is available. And in a couple of slides, I have the websites as well. But it is, I would say there's a plethora of information that we have online. And it's really great to be able to go down and kind of dig into it when you, when you have some time so that you can see some of this information for yourself. It's a really wonderful resource, so I encourage you to visit those sites. Um, I do have some caveats that I want to start with. This is a presentation uh, that in past weeks, Kate Fritchie with also within Maine DHHS has done, um, and we just kind of both feel it's important to talk a little bit about the data and what it represents, as well as just some of the things to consider. Um, so some of the data that I'm going to be talking about, it is the number of people who have received at least one dose of the three products that are currently on the market. It's either one dose of um, Pfizer or Moderna, the first dose, or um, a person with one dose of the J&J. &J. <clears throat> Some of the population estimates by county race and ethnicity data, they do come from the Census Bureau five-year update that was done between 2015 and 2019. So there, you know, there has been a couple of years that have passed between them and we might see some shifts um, in population at the, um, at the uh, county and zip code level. And the zip code population comes from 2018. This data, uh, Wayne Carino within DHHS updated this for data up until uh, May 22nd, so the week ending last week. Um, this is something that I, I think probably Tanya would um, cheer me for saying, and I hope it's not something she also said, but we really say the data that we share is only as good as the data that we get. And so it's really important, especially as we continue moving on in Maine's vaccination response to ensure that the data that we are using is as accurate as possible, is as reflective of the population that we are vaccinating as possible. And this really is a partnership between the state and providers who are um, undertaking vaccine efforts. So we really appreciate um, your work to collect accurate data and also be able to report into impact accurate data. It's something that knowing how many um, vaccines and vaccinations are happening on a daily basis, there are a lot of um, challenges that we faced that I know from both a provider perspective as well as a state perspective that we just want to continue working through. Um, the main immunization program does have a four staff that work on a routine basis to make sure that they are going through and cleaning the data that we receive. 
Some of the things that often from a data quality perspective that are missing include um, the zip code and then really race and ethnicity data are other points that we've really been working to ensure that this data is being collected and being reported so that we can accurately reflect that. All right, so for those of you who haven't seen the two um, sites that I'm going to be referencing, these are the um, data dashboards that we have. One um, really is more at a county level and has things such as age. It was one of the screenshots that Lisa shared. And then there's a different site that also when it does drill down to zip code. These all can be accessed via the COVID-19 website, which is main.gov forward slash COVID-19 forward slash vaccine. Um, I did um, take the opportunity. This was a um, screen that um, had been shared with us from the Maine Health Index, which I think um, sometimes, especially when you're really immersed in the vaccine work, it can, um, the past couple of weeks, as some of the vaccination rates have slowed down a little bit, it's really important to reflect the progress that we continue to make. And so I wanted to show this slide really has a way to reflect um, at a macro level, how even within you know, a couple of week period, how Maine continues to move forward. So a quick kind of reference here, what we're looking for is um, things to go from blue to green and then red to yellow, which really means that we're hitting a benchmark of more than 60% of the population within each zip code that has been vaccinated. And then the, the different colors just kind of represent the number of people at each zip code level. So you can see how, um, especially in Southern Maine, there has been a, a large portion that went from red to yellow, especially along the coastline, and then in some of the more rural areas going from blue to green. So it really does reflect the tremendous progress that as a state we have been making. All right, um, so I do want to give the disclosure that these next couple of slides are very data heavy. Uh, there is a lot that's going on in them, and it really is just to kind of give a snapshot in regard to some of our rates. Um, this first one is vaccination rates by county, and this is for those who are 12 plus. You can see Cumberland, Knox, Lincoln, and Sagadahawk, really some of the coastal areas that are leading the way with Cumberland having a high of 77% of the population age 12 plus and vaccinated. And then some of the more rim areas or rural counties being lower with Somerset at 50%. One of the things to remember, and I think this is on this slide as well as the next, is that um, this excludes vaccinations that have been given by the Department of Defense, the VA, and through some of the tribal health centers. So it's not necessarily every single um, vaccination that has been provided. Um, there, It is a bit of a um, pie slice of it, although it is a large pie slice of it. <clears throat> this is um, vaccination rates by read, uh, race and ethnicity. Um, and you can see here that there is some uh, differences in terms of the total population that has been vaccinated um, with a white population having 48%, which is um, you know just about one in two, but with a low for black population at 39% and American Indian at 40%. It does um, somewhat equal out though, um, as you go into the various age ranges, in particular for those that are 50, 50 plus, um, the rates for white, Asian and American Indian are actually about um, you know, on par with each other and the black population having about 85% nearly. <clears throat> for ethnicity, you can see of the total population vaccinated, they are about the same. There are um, discrepancies when we get to the 50 plus. Um, so measuring vaccine rates, this is by zip code, and this is truly where um, we do get pretty data heavy. This is um, for those who are 16 plus, I believe. And again, this comes from the 2018 data. Um, and really, this is where I would say that what we have on this slide is for zip codes that have above 75% vaccinated, we have them listed out by county here. So just for reference, you can see for Cumberland, there are two. Hancock that we really start to get down into. Oh, I'm sorry, Cumberland, we have more than two. My apologies, I was reading the slides wrong. Um, Hancock, we have more than that. Um, for those of you who don't um, need to get down into the weeds of every single town here, again, I would say go to the website. And really where this um, data in particular becomes helpful is identifying where that kind of hyper-local approach to reaching out and engaging with towns, whether it be with town leadership, schools within those towns, um, or um, additional uh, contacts that you might have, whether it's an employer in those towns is really helpful. 
especially for those when we get to this data, which is for zip codes with less than 40% vaccinated. So this is really when you think about it, those areas where we do want to make sure that that, that targeted outreach is happening because this is where these pockets of um, people with lower vaccination rates are happening. <clears throat> I think what, you know, also important to reference is that for some of these towns in particular, um, there is not a huge population that is within some of these towns um, so that they, you know, we are talking about some of the smaller um, and more rural towns within Maine. <clears throat> this slide here is zip codes with the most remaining unvaccinated and not surprising, it really is some of our more urban centers within Maine that have that higher population. But you can see here, um, one of the um, larger towns with the most unvaccinated is in Lewiston, followed by Bangor and Waterville. Uh, this really does get to its, um, there are vaccine opportunities areas. It's just kind of continued outreach and a diversity of offerings that is going to be important to continue reaching people who are not yet vaccinated. So this is Lisa, could I just um, jump in on that one for you one sure second back there? Yeah. So, you know, I just wanted to underscore, I think, you know, when we start talking about how counties are doing and, and you know, towns, and we hear, um, you know, that, hey, Portland is doing great at, you know, 79% of people vaccinated. This slide points out the fact that, okay, yes, but because Portland has such a, a big, uh, you know, number of people uh, there or or any of these other ones, Westbrook, South Portland, even on the higher end of vaccination rate, there's still a lot of people who need vaccination, right? So it's part of the message here to clinicians is even if you're in an area with a high vaccination rate, there's still a lot of people that need vaccine. So I just wanted to underscore um, that point. No, absolutely, Lisa. Thank you. And I think it gets to um, something that as Maine's vaccine response continues to shift and evolve over the summer, what I think is important is having a diversity of offerings where people can be vaccinated. And Lisa, as you said in the beginning, you know, really having um, a trusted provider have this be as a source is really that this is how we will continue to make progress in reaching some of these populations. And that's just um, ensuring that they have access to it through a source that is um, comfortable, that they have convenient, and that is one that they have trust in. And that there are still large numbers who remain unvaccinated. <clears throat> Um, and then really getting down deep, deep into the um, granular level, this truly is for zip codes where there's less than 60% of the people um, have been vaccinated, but that again, they have more than 2000 remaining. This again, when we talk about like kind of hyper local outreach efforts or really, um, you know, kind of local um, engagement. These are some of those towns where it is good to have that focus on because they are where there are a fair number of people who still remain unvaccinated. And those are the ones we want to, to continue to reach. These are not sorted by um, county. These are truly by the number of people who have been unvaccinated. As you can see, Lewiston is, is kind of leading that way there. I'll quickly scroll through this again, knowing it's very data heavy and really one of the best things to do is to go on to the website. All right, and that is it for me. Great, well, thank you. And um, uh, I know it's it's a bit of a, a tease to have this you know, come in front of you very quickly, but we just really wanted to um, make a pitch for why this is needed uh, in various communities around the state. So with that, I'm gonna to switch to Tanya Philbrook from Maine CDC and the Maine Immunization Program. Many of you know Tanya well already from um, your communications with that program and the Thursday vaccine provider calls, but uh, we haven't always talked on these calls about sort of some of the nuts and bolts. So with that, Tanya, appreciate your help to walk through some of the steps that if practices um, either are already approved COVID vaccine providers or are not, what else they need to do and what uh, vaccination would actually look like in practice. So thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so good morning. So I'm going to go into a little bit more of where did that data come from that Kristen just represented? How does that data get there? And this is all in partnership with the providers who have currently offered vaccine in the data that they're reporting to us. So my name is Tanya Philbrook. I'm the Immunization um, Program Director for the state of Maine. Um, Wanted to let you know that we have some of our traditional work that we do within our program with our vaccines for children's, but now have pivoted towards more of the um, COVID vaccine distribution as well. 
And when I'm talking about COVID vaccine distribution, um, along with the VFC distribution in the state of Maine, there is two different reporting criteria for this and two different mechanisms on how to receive the vaccine. So what I'm gonna go over with you this morning is how to get and obtain COVID vaccine for your practice. And how do you start offering that to the patients that you see on a routine basis? So what you're seeing on your screen right now, some of you may be familiar with, is our immunizeme.org website, which is the main immunization programs website for the state of Maine. Traditionally, we've had just pediatrics, adolescents, and adults, pregnancy and providers on here. Now you'll see a, um, three different more icons on our screen with the COVID-19 providers, another icon that goes into vaccination and main vaccination sites, and then FAQs and other questions that you could use and gain knowledge in with starting to answer some of the questions that you may be getting from the patients that want to know from you, wanting to know if this is the right decision for them to receive this vaccine. Most of the information I'm going to be going over today, you'll be clicking on the icon COVID-19 providers. And this will go into how to set up and become a provider, some of the tools that you'll need to be successful in offering the vaccine and storing the vaccine, and other areas within the website that will give you information um, for more of the nuts and bolts of what you need to know with becoming a COVID provider. So to enroll as a COVID provider, it's different than our Vaccines for Children's program. You're actually going to click on the um, second part of what you're seeing on your slide that says vaccine provider forms. This form is done in red cap. However, before you get to that form, it's crucial that you go and look at the enrollment checklist to make sure that what you're agreeing to and offering this COVID vaccine, that you're going to be able to fulfill these requirements. Another good um, position on this is the um, vaccine provider FAQs. This will give you some of the details that you also need. I am gonna go into um, a little bit more of what's in the checklist right now to make sure that when you become a provider, you're understanding some of the requirements, which are different than the requirements for the Vaccines for Children's program. So you do have to have a separate provider agreement outside of your current VFC provider agreement to offer and to obtain the COVID-19 vaccine. The sections are very similar, similar to the um, routine VFC provider agreement with the needing to know where this vaccine is going to be stored, where it's going to be um, <clears throat> shipped to, and who's going to be administering it to. We do also obtain signatures like we do with our routine vaccines for children program um, provider agreement. But what we have with this is it's a fillable electronic um, PDF format. Some of the things that you're agreeing to is making sure that you're documenting the COVID-19 vaccination. Different from the VFC program, COVID-19 vaccination needs to be documented within 24 hours of administration. Now this can be done as you're logging it through your EMR. And if your EMR has an interface with our impact system, that data will flow down automatically. So you have met your reporting requirement. If you are a practice that is doing data entry um, into the impact system, you need to come up with a process on how you're going to accomplish making sure that the doses that you have administered are recorded within impact within 24 hours of administration. Similar to the VFC program, we need to make sure that where you're storing this vaccine is meeting specific requirements. Um, we want to make sure that you do have your um, digital data logger temperature monitoring device. However, if you are a VFC provider, you do not need to send in pictures of your refrigerator or your thermometer. We already have that on file. So this is one step that you will not have to go through with um, trying to set up to be, um, offer COVID-19 vaccine at your office. Another piece of this is your educational requirements. Um, routinely, you have to do an annual education with the immunization program. You also will have to do a COVID-19 educational requirement um, <clears throat> prior to receiving the COVID vaccine in your office. And we do have that um, training and webinar available on our website as well. <clears throat> so I just wanted to show you a quick snapshot of what the first page would look like. Um, like I said before, it's a little bit different than filling out your Vaccines for Children agreement. This is um, a red cap survey that you'll be completing and you just go through and fill out the boxes that are available that pertain to your practice. 
this is how we have to report up to the US CDC. Um, we have to report how many doses that have been administered. This is also, when you're looking at the data that Kristen just um, represented, we're also being able to see where is the vaccine residing in the state. And after you do that doses administered data entry within 24 hours, you would see that our website will be updated um, like Lisa showed you as well with how many doses have been administered, whether it's that first dose or that completed series across the state. And also where we can get down to that zip code data to make sure that we are targeting our vaccine efforts and um, covering any area that may need vaccination. So this is different than, like I said before, how you do your VFC enrollment form that's embedded within our immunization system impact. So we've tried to make it easier for everybody um, that wants to become a provider to obtain, VF, um, to obtain COVID vaccine. Now, this is an agreement with the US CDC, not specifically with the Maine Immunization Program or with Maine DHHS. Now, I'm going to briefly go into the storage and handling. Some of the caveats of um, us not distributing the Pfizer vaccine widely across the state is um, in the prior stages of the EUA, there was a requirement for ultra cold storage. In the past two weeks, the EUA has been amended. And this is a blessing for us now that we've opened up for children and the EUA has changed for um, any child 12 and older to receive vaccine. So this gives us the opportunity to have vaccine more plentiful across the state targeting those adolescents. When you think of Pfizer vaccine, you're thinking of a step down approach with this. You may receive this vaccine um, in a package from US CDC with um, dry ice on it. After receive this vaccine, you can then put it in your ultra cold freezer, or you can move it right into your routine freezer, um, similar to where you store your MMR or your varicella vaccine. It can be maintained in that freezer for up to two weeks. And now we're gonna take another step down. We um, have currently, the EUA has been extended so that the Pfizer vaccine can now be stored in your refrigerator as well. So two weeks in the freezer, take another step down and you can have that vaccine stored for up to one month in your refrigerator. This will give you a little bit more lenience on how many days that you can have this vaccine at your facility and be able to offer it to your patients. So remember, step down with Pfizer vaccine, which is different than the other two vaccines that I'm going to be discussing. The next vaccine is the Moderna vaccine. Traditionally, Moderna had been sent out in 10 dose vials. So the increments of ordering was 100 doses. The current um, EUA has just been modified and changed now that there will be a 14 dose file instead of a 10 dose file. With Moderna vaccine, different than the Pfizer vaccine, this vaccine is stored in your freezer, your routine freezer, like I said before, with your MMR and your varicella vaccine. And then you do a step down into the refrigerator. The refrigerator then, then can be stored from 36 to 46 degrees for up to 30 days. And again, these are unpunctured vials. And after you have punctured your vial, you have up to 12 hours to utilize that vaccine. So the clock starts ticking once you puncture that vial. And this is where you wanna maximize the doses that you're utilizing within your practice. Make sure that you have people on call that you could get in there to, um, that may are due for their second dose if they've received a first dose elsewhere or someone who is entertaining the idea of receiving that first dose of vaccine. The next vaccine that's currently out there in circulation is the Janssen vaccine or referred to as the J&J &J and the one and done. This vaccine it does not need to be frozen. This vaccine is stored in your routine refrigerator. So 36 to 46 degrees. Um, and this vaccine has about a 90 day expiration date on it. So one thing to think about with these vaccines is these vaccines do not have preservatives. So the expiration date is a lot shorter than what you have traditionally seen when you receive your current vaccines for children that have the 12 month to 18 month expiration date. So three different vaccine types, one goes from ultra cold to freezer to refrigerator. The second one is Moderna, which goes from your freezer to refrigerator. And then your third one is your J&J &J vaccine that goes directly into your refrigerator. So you have the opportunity to carry the three different vaccines with each three different vaccines. There's different um, packaging sizes as well. 
So beginning this past Monday, yesterday, we have opened up COVID vaccine ordering within our impact system. You will only see the ordering capability if you have on file with us a COVID vaccine um, provider agreement. Again, we need to make sure um, with the US CDC that anybody who is ordering this vaccine or has this vaccine in their facility has a US CDC COVID-19 vaccine provider agreement on file with us. So as of right now, the minimum, minimum ordering size for Moderna vaccine through impact is 140 doses with a maximum amount of 700 doses. Currently, the Pfizer packaging is at 1,170 doses with a maximum ordering of 7,020. The J&J &J vaccine has a minimum packaging of 100 with a maximum packaging of 500. I wanna go into two different um, avenues with this. One, the Pfizer vaccine will be changing the shipping containers we're seeing by the end of this month, beginning of June you'll have the availability to order not only the 1,170 doses, but the, there'll be a new packaging size of 450 doses. So there'll be a smaller packaging size. Another thing I wanna let you know is this is the vaccine that will come right from the US CDC's vaccine distribution, distribution center. However, if you need smaller packaging sizes of Pfizer, we are able to accommodate that by transferring vaccine to you from our public health emergency warehouse. We're trying to make sure that carrying the vaccine um, and with the packaging sizes coming from US CDC is not a burden upon providers um, being nervous about not being able to utilize that 1170 doses. We know that you may not have that need. So what we're trying to do to accommodate with that Pfizer vaccine is again, um, having you order that in smaller doses. We can only go down to dose size of 100 for Pfizer. And the reason why is because of the packaging the vaccine from the FDA. Along with these three different vaccines that you receive from us, you also receive ancillary supply kits. These ancillary supply kits consist of syringes, um, face mask, a face shield. Um, I believe it may have Band-Aids in that and everything that you need in there to reconstitute the vaccine if needed or to just draw the vaccine out of the vial um, with J&J &J and be able to remember. Now, if you would like a vaccine order size less than what you're seeing on the minimum sizes on these screen for Pfizer, there's an email address on here. It's c19allocations.mecdc at main.gov. You email that request. And then we facilitate a transfer and we have deliveries on two days a week within this on Wednesdays and Fridays to have that vaccine delivered to your facility. And Tanya, can you just comment on the lowest vaccine size request or the, the order size? Yeah, so the lowest vaccine is for, um, 100. For J&J, &J, it's 100. And for Pfizer, if you send an email request into us, it can be down to 100. If you have the storage capabilities and have enough patients, you can order up to the um, 100, um, 1,170 doses, and that would be a direct ship from the US CDC's vaccination um, depot. Now, another thing to think about when you're doing your vaccine ordering, is traditionally with um, the VFC vaccines, you also need to make sure that you're compliant with your documentation with an impact. So we need to make sure that your hours of operation are open, that you have your delivery address up to date, that your primary and backup point of contact information is in there, and that um, your temperature logs for all your units where you'll be storing vaccine is also recorded in impact. Now, another thing that I'm gonna make another plug for is um, recording those doses administered within 24 hours. This is part of the requirement with the US CDC provider agreement. Another thing is reconciling your inventory within the past 14 days. As we have seen vaccine coming in in floods and transferring vaccine from one provider location to another, it's important, more important than ever to make sure that you're doing a physical count for these vaccines and that you are recording any vaccines that have expired or spoiled or that you will not be using. 
I stress the physical count on this because there is no preservative in this vaccine and the expiration date is short. So we wanna make sure that you are make, um, utilizing your first vaccine that's going to expire, making sure that that's in the um, front of the refrigerator. Now, ordering vaccines look a little bit different than what you have traditionally done within our impact system. You will see um, on the left-hand side of the screen that there's a pandemic vaccine request. This is where you will be ordering your COVID-19 vaccine only. So you click on that pandemic vaccine request link. It brings you to an order page. This order page goes through and shows you which vaccine presentation is available, the trade name, the manufacturer, and the packaging size. It gives you the NDC numbers that you need. Um, this is um, more importantly, making sure your EMRs are up to date with this, and then your minimum order and quantity. Now you will see on this screen that this screen was just mocked up for training purposes, but the minimum order and quantity with the J, J vaccine is 100. We will also be able to see how many doses you have on hand. If we look at your enrollment data and we see that um, you may have ordered more vaccine that you could go through within the time period of the viability of this vaccine, we may give you a call to say, hey, what's up? Was this a typo? Are you doing a special clinic in your area? Um, is there any assistance that you need um, and any partnerships that you need to continue to create? The next thing you do after you fill in the amount of doses that you're requesting is click that submit request button. You'll have a um, notation on the top of your screen that says your vaccine request has been submitted successfully. My vaccine management staff are approving orders daily um, for COVID vaccine and you could receive it within three to five days of submitting your order. Um, there's a couple different um, email addresses I put on the screen. These are crucial um, for helping to help communicate and to answer the questions you may have. The first one on here is for really just planning logistics. Um, if you have any specific questions that you um, want to have, any follow-up questions for the stakeholder or vaccine planning work group that I do on Thursdays. And then the second email on this is um, if you need to submit any of your COVID-19 um, vaccine enrollment forms. For instance, if you are not currently a vaccines for children's provider with us, you will have to take a picture of your storage unit and your data loggers and submit them. And that's all I have for today, Lisa. Okay, um, if you can, thank you very much, Tanya. Um, I'm just gonna flip back to just a couple more um, slides that I have and then uh, we'll wrap it up. I know uh, there's several questions in the chat, so thanks for those and we'll get right to those. So just a reminder about reporting adverse events uh, in the VAERS, the Vaccine and Adverse Event Reporting System. Um, even if you did not give the vaccine, if you're talking to your patients and they're saying, I think I have this or that, you know, related to the vaccine, it is really important to um, report adverse events, whether or not you think that they're, you know, uh, definitely related to vaccine through the VAERS system. That is the national system for tracking adverse events. It's how we know whether something is just, you know, a, a fluke or um, occurring at a rate higher than the population average. Uh, so just a, a, um, a plug to take complaints seriously and uh, just, just report them. Um, the uh, other thing I just wanted to note is a change in the pop-up clinics. Previously, we had considered those as kind of equity pop-up clinics with a particular focus on equity. We certainly are still very focused on equity, but we've uh, broadened that um, capacity to uh, have anybody in the community, whether it's clinician or community organizations, host pop-up clinics to vaccinate 10 or more individuals. Uh, there is a new application. The link is live on that. Um, actually, I'll, I'll put the, the, so we'll post these slides as usual, all of them uh, afterwards. Um, and you can get the links there, but I'll, I'll post the link in the chat as well. Uh, and if the provider organization is an approved vaccine provider, obviously they would do it. But um, if it's a community organization, then the main immunization program links them with an approved provider. And we look for the community organizations to really try to um, find places that are going to work the best. Um, just a, a quick note that we are now doing our regular half an hour sessions twice a month. Um, June may be the last month for that, uh, but the next one would be June 8th. We are hoping to focus more on uh, effective communications. We don't really have a lot of time to talk about that today, but you know, what do you say when your patient says X, what do you say? Um, so we're gonna be planning uh, to focus on that. As always, we post the information and with that, uh, we'll go to the question. So um, 
you know, you're usually pretty good at tracking those. Do you want to yeah. start at the top? So the, I think the first one's for Dr. Pinoy and Dr. Sears. Can someone please talk a bit about how to provide guidance to people who are taking immunosuppressants and receive a COVID vaccine? Should they still be masking distancing? Do we know when data will be available about vaccine effectiveness for this group? Well, I can, I can start out. There's several questions wrapped up in there. And then Dr. Pernoy, I'd be happy to get her opinion also. Um, I think the problem is, is we use the term immunosuppressed um, as a very broad term that, you know, relates to some people taking steroids or a little, some, some cancer chemotherapy or, you know, um, antibodies for various inflammatory conditions all the way to transplantation. Um, what do we know? We know that people have had transplants do not seem to um, develop um, significant immune responses to these vaccines. That's not surprising. Do they actually work? We don't know that. Um, we just know that if you, if you do sophisticated measurement, um, if you go all the way back down that spectrum, um, it tends to um, be more effective the less immunosuppressed somebody is. The guidance is um, that, I mean, the concern is that these individuals are at greater risk for COVID in the first place. And so it is recommended at this time to vaccinate them. Um, and um, it is not recommended to do antibodies afterwards because the antibodies that are being measured aren't necessarily the ones that you want to know about um, and the ones that would actually give you um, any um, security or, or, um, or any knowledge that this has been effective overall. So that's the CDC um, also has within its guidance, this, this what I just specifically said, but it also says more information will be developed over the coming time. And this, this section will be updated. Um, so that's kind of what we know, but I don't know, Dr. Panoya, whether you've got anything else you wanted to add to that. No, Steve, that's perfectly succinct. I think we don't know what we don't know yet on that. So two kind of related questions. Have the guidance changed between the 14 days between different vaccines? And I know we've answered yes, but the second question is, are we anticipating doing flu and COVID vaccines together as clinics in the fall? All right, Tanya, I would have you answer that one. So the guidance have changed. You can co-administer both um, the COVID-19 vaccine along with any other vaccine. Um, the anticipation of doing COVID clinics in the fall will be based upon um, what we may see for uptake in our 12 years old and older, and if there's still a need to vaccinate those school-age children. Um, so that could be a possibility for this fall, but as you know, we're really trying to push right now for those children to get vaccinated and schools around the state are currently having those vaccination clinics and there'll be ongoing efforts throughout the summer. So it's still unknown at this time whether there will be a co-clinic with a COVID vaccine in influenza vaccine. I think there's a lot to learn over the next few months. And um, there also is potential of a second EUA being um, for the Moderna vaccine being brought down to 12 years old and older. Um, so that will be a change and that will be also more availability of vaccine that could be administered to these individuals. So there's a lot to a, a lot that we don't know about this fall for clinics, but yes, the original question is you can co-administer both vaccines. Well, Tanya, this is for you. If you completed a provider agreement for practices in November for COVID, you need to resubmit through the process just for review. No, you do not. You should have the availability turned on within your impact system right now to um, order that vaccine. So go over to the left-hand side of your screen, go into the pandemic ordering, and you should be able to see that turned on for you. Tanya, the hot topic is around vaccine wastage. Can you speak to vaccine wastage? They're trying to give this to people in the office, but they're wasting more than they administer through the vaccine clinic. Yeah, so this is um, still a topic of conversation here at DHHS as well. Um, as we wanna make sure that we're not missing up any opportunities to vaccinate, we also wanna to try to minimize waste at any um, avenue that we can. So, you know, what are some of the best practices that you can do? Um, do you have a waiting list of people? Can you offer vaccine twice a week at your office for the COVID-19 vaccine um, and have them come in in groups? 
Um, can you offer it to anybody who brought the individual to their um, appointment? So we are seeing that there is and there will be an increase of waste by offering vaccine in your offices. Now, one of the things I do want to let you know is, you know, over the years, we have had a very strict vaccine wasted policy with our vaccines for children's program. Um, this COVID-19 vaccine does not pertain to the vaccines for children's um, wastage policy. So I want to just make sure that if there's any fear or any nervousness about ordering this vaccine and having to repay it, this vaccine is not part of that process at all in part of the vaccines that you're offering to have to repay. This is a total, total set of that different set of vaccine with funding from the US CDC. And the benefits of having this vaccine is to make sure we can offer it, offer it in as many um, facilities as we can so we don't miss those opportunities. The next question is around post-COVID vaccine cardiomyopathy. There's been some reports recently around potentially children receiving the Pfizer vaccine and older adults. I know, Steve, you've started to answer it into the chat box, but do you want to just verbally say? Sure. No, I, I think this is uh, one of those that is, it's, it's a breaking story now. There have been a, a small number of individuals identified after um, it appears to be the mRNA vaccines with uh, mild cardiomy um, cardiomyitis. And that was originally seen actually in Israel. There was a small group. Um, there was then an evaluation by federal CDC, which could not find a, um, a direct, any direct correlation. Um, Recently, there have been um, um, cases, again, um, coming up, but again, very small numbers if you look at the 100 million doses or so of mRNA vaccines that have been given. Nonetheless, it is being looked at very seriously. It has also hit the news, so you will hear about it. Um, and um, whether there is a small but real risk, we don't know, because right now there is also a background rate of myocarditis. And this is myocarditis, not really significant cardiomyopathy, because most of this tends to respond or resolve within a short period of time. So I think, it's, I think we all have to know about it, um, and we need to follow it, just like the, you know, the other um, individual situations we've seen with vaccines and concerns. And this is, you know, again, this is back to a plug for Lisa and um, and the VAERS program as she makes sure we bring that up every time because that's how these things are found, um, if they exist. Um, and the only way it's really um, identified is by looking at some sort of um, accumulated numbers on different conditions. So right now, um, I think we'll hear more about this within the next week or two. Um, the last I heard from CDC, they were having a hard time again trying to determine whether this was real compared to the background rate. Um, but it is it is something to, to monitor right now. I don't know anybody, whether Lisa or Anya or Peggy, you have anything else you want to add to that? Well, I, I just would underscore again what um, you said, uh, Steve, quickly is that, that there is a background rate, right? So any of these things, stuff happens. People get vaccine and, and it might be related or it might just be that it was gonna happen anyway, right? So we don't know yet. And the only way to, to figure that out is to be looking at those numbers uh, and comparing them to baseline rates. And I'm you know stating the obvious uh, to some degree, but I just think as it hits the newspapers, PD, people immediately conclude that um, you know association is causation. And I think in order to be able to you know uh, have informed conversations with patients, we need to be able to have that discussion with them as well. So. Uh, absolutely report them and we need to, you know, any, any um, uh, uh, toward goings on uh, after vaccine and then we need to leave it to CDC and, and ASAP to review the data on a larger basis and figure out if there's a connection. Um, Tanya, here's a question for you. How long, if a practice wanted to offer vaccine but doesn't have a provider agreement, what you, what's really the timing to really start the process to actually getting vaccine from your standpoint? Like how long does it, should they be planning that this is gonna take? Yeah, so we process provide agreements every day. Um, it does take about 48 hours for it to go through multiple systems up to the US CDC for approval. Um, and then within um, a day after that, you can start ordering vaccine. And again, remember we can deliver vaccine on Wednesdays and Fridays right from our public health emergency warehouse. 
we can look at other providers that are in your area that may have a surplus of vaccine and get that transferred over to you, or you can order directly um, and have that vaccine shipped to you from the um, US CDC warehouse. So it could be up to a week, um, but no longer than that. Great. That's all I see in the chat box. I don't know, Lisa, if you see any more questions on your side. I don't think so. Um, I also wanted to open it up if people want to unmute and ask questions directly, or if, or if anybody has experience um, doing vaccine directly in your practice um, that you want to share with folks. Uh, practices, lessons learned. Um, I, I will also say, you know, we know that there are a lot of challenges um, right now. There are, you know, still a relatively no, a small number of independent practices that are, um, have been able to offer vaccine and, and most of the hospital owned practices have uh, the hospitals or the health systems, you know, have deferred to doing it there. And I think it, it's just important to think about how does that um, evolve over time? Again, you know, as we not only to get the those in the middle who you know might benefit from the relationship with clinicians, but with the real possibility, if not likelihood, that there were maybe booster shots for a lot of the, these vaccines. You know, how do we integrate it over time um, into the more uh, routine care and regular flow of uh, care, primary care, really, um, out in communities? So uh, I think it's it's important now, and it's going to remain important over time. So really urge people to be thinking about that. All right. Well, if there are no other questions or anything anybody wants to add, open up for more time. Then we will conclude. So um, thank you all. We are hosting uh, similar sessions again this Friday, uh, May 28th um, at noontime. So what would normally be our um, 12 to 1230, uh, be 12 to one. And then again, next Thursday, June 3rd with the Primary Care Association, that's a different link if people have seen um, that uh, we'll be sharing more. I'll be sure to put it in the slides at the end of this one as well um, uh, at four o'clock next, next a week from Thursday. Uh, so thank you all. We really appreciate your joining, your consideration of how we continue to evolve this strategy to reach more people and, uh, get us vaccinated. So thanks. Uh, thanks, Tanya, Steve, Amy, uh, Kristen for joining. Um, and thank you all. Bye-bye.